It's my very great pleasure now to welcome you all to this uh, uh, series of uh, uh, one of one of a series of AGU uh, talk, uh, distinguished speakers talks. Uh, uh, at the outset, I'm, I must express how grateful we are to the AGU for actually making this possible, because it's probably one of the mechanisms by which uh, people all over the world would get to hear people uh, uh, like Professor James Head, who's our going to be our speaker for this evening. So it's actually a good evening to all those in India, and it's a good morning to all those in the in the US, and it probably is an afternoon if somebody else has joined in from somewhere else, so, because I have put it on Facebook as well, so there might be a few people joining in elsewhere. And you have Indians everywhere, so I presume there'd be a fair number. Uh, so uh, it's my, my very great pleasure to welcome you, Professor Head, to uh, virtually, unfortunately, to the Department of Geology and Geophysics at IIT Kharagpur. But to, to introduce us, I would hand over to Professor uh, uh, Shashi Prakash Sharma. He was our head of department. He'll mention a few things about our institute and the department for the benefit of all listeners. Professor Sharma, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. Uh, uh, good evening to all the colleagues in India. Uh, good morning to friends in US and uh, uh, namaste uh, to all friends around the globe. Uh, I welcome you all today's talk by Professor James W. Head III, uh, distinguished professor in the Department of Earth Science, Environment and Planetary Science at Brown University, USA. Uh, coming to our about IIT system, uh, I would like to convey that soon after independence in 1947, with a vision for technological and societal development in the country, IIT system was established in India. IIT Kharagpur was established in 1951, and it is the first one in the IT system. Today, country has uh, more than 20 IITs in different parts of the country. Uh, started with a few departments only. Our institute has developed uh, in all dimensions, and presently we have more than 50 departments, center, and schools. Certainly, population-wise, is the biggest. Uh, our strength is also largest. IIT Kharagpur is also starting a medical education and a hospital, which is unique in our IIT system. Now, coming to our department, our Department of Geology and Geophysics is the oldest in its kind and entire IT system. And it was started in 1951 itself. The department has witnessed a remarkable growth in its academic activity over the last seven decades. The invaluable contribution over the years by several eminent professors and scientists have helped evolve an academic unit into a leading and well-respected geology and geophysics department in the country. Our alumni have done extremely well in academia as well as in corporate sector, both in India and abroad. Over the years, the department has developed a reputation of top quality teaching in both classical and applied art sciences. In the department, currently we are running five different programs, four UG and one PG. Uh, field is our actual laboratory, and we traditionally have a very strong field training program, both in geology and geophysics. Uh, in the department, currently we have more than 600 UG and PG students, 140 research scholars, and seven postdoctoral researchers. Our faculty strength is at present 29, and we are hoping to have many more in future. Uh, we have teaching and research in versatile discipline of both geology and geophysics. Faculty members are engaged in individual as well as collaborative research in the department and institute as well as outside organization in India and abroad. In the department, we have numerous laboratory related with traditional teaching as well as advanced research facilities such as EPMA, SEM, MCI, CP, MS, table isotope lab, engineering geology, hydrogeological equipment. On geophysics side, we have a seismological observatory, a large number of broadband seismometers deployed across the country for continuous recording, gravimeter, magnetometer, electrical resistivity tomography equipment, MT, nuclear geophysics, and ground penetrating radar equipment. So in a nutshell, about our department, we have expert faculty members and facilities to do cutting edge research in the style field of geology and geophysics. So this is about our department. I welcome you all. Uh, now I hand over to Professor Saival Gupta to introduce. Uh, thank you, Professor Sharma, uh, uh, for actually summarizing what our department is for the benefit of uh, 
Professor Head also, she, he knows where he's, to whom he's speaking. So you, uh, I think one of the most impressive things which Professor Sharma mentioned is we have 140 plus PhD students right now. So it's, it's actually a huge set working in a huge range of disciplines and it's, uh, it's across different things, different uh, spectrum of earth sciences. So it's my, my pleasure to actually introduce uh, uh, Professor James Head. So as uh, he formerly, he's, uh, his name would be James W. Head III, and he's the Lewis and Elizabeth Church uh, Distinguished Professor in the Department of Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences at Brown University. So uh, he, he started off with an undergraduate degree from the Washington New University in 1964, and he did his PhD from Brown University itself in 1969. Now, from 1968 to 72, I think he'll be talking about this a bit in his talk as well. He was serving at the NASA headquarters and he was uh, involved in the selection of landing sites for the Apollo program and in training of astronaut crews in geology and surface exploration and planning and evaluating the package of experiments to be deployed on the moon and in mission operations in Houston during uh, lunar surface operation, uh, exploration. So for all of these, he received the NASA Medal for Exceptional Scientific Achievement and the Geological Society of America Special Commendation. He is still involved in the training of uh, NASA astronauts. From 1973 to 74, he was interim director of the Lunar Science Institute in Houston. He has also been a director of the NASA Northeast Regional Data Center. He's been he's served on the editorial board of numerous journals. He has been elected to the fellowship in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancements of Science, the American Geophysical Union, the Geological Society of America, the Meteoritical Society, and he's also been the president of the Planetary Geology Division of GSA and the Planetology section of the AGU. As far as his work, I mean, we know about his work on the moon, which he'll be talking about, but Apart from this, he's also been investigated volcanic activities on other planets and their satellites, for example, on Mercury, Venus, and Mars, and also he's been involved in work on Europa. He, on Mars, he's proposed a global paleoclimate models, and he's studied the morph uh, formation of morphological structures, such as the outflow channels and the valley networks on Mars. He's also supplemented them with terrestrial analog studies. I think there's at least one analog study that he's done. He's also investigated the rheological properties of lava flows on the Martian surface, and he's looked for ice in the Martian subsurface. Uh, his interests on the surface of Mercury include volcanic vents, glacial morphologies, polar ice deposits, as well as basin formation. And he's also been uh, interested in volcanic activity and the crustal evolution modeling of Venus, as well as Europa. And uh, he's uh, particularly uh, done quite a bit of very uh, intriguing work on the cryovolcanism on the surface of Europa. For what he's done on the moon, there's probably uh, no end to it. And since the topic of his talk is on what's come from the Apollo lunar missions, so I will actually invite Professor he uh, Head from now on to talk uh, onwards for 50 years since the Apollo lunar exploration program, how we did it, what we learned, and why we need to return. Before I will switch off my camera now and, and, and my audio, I will also request most in the audience to do the same, apart from Professor Head. And uh, finally, when the question answer session starts, maybe it would be best that if you could write into the chat box and I could uh, read them out. And if not, we can ask directly, but it would be one at a time. We'd need to keep it less messy so that we can all follow your questions and we can listen to Professor Head's uh, replies. Okay, Professor Head, please, now. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, sadly, remotely, because I would love to visit. I would really love to visit, but unfortunately, uh, that's not possible at this time. We hope that'll be the case in the future, because I'd really like to sit with you and hear all about the details of all the PhD theses that are going on and the research in, at this incredible institution. Uh, so I look forward to that in the future. I hope you'll invite me back uh, in person this time. Uh, and so I think you know a really important point here is, as you pointed out, um, your institution and department are, are very, very well known internationally, and I think I want to emphasize here uh, one of the kinds of things that the uh, institution really has focused on, which is that, you know, not just doing science here, science there, but interacting with the larger uh, program, if you will, of science and engineering. Uh, I think this is critically important because this is how we really were able to achieve and accomplish what we actually did in Apollo. Science and engineering synergism working together uh, is really, really critical. So I want to emphasize that today. So let's step back and think about where we are right now, if you will. Um, if we think about this, uh, for example, 
Um, we indeed, um, it's been 50 years since the Apollo program. Hard for me to believe, it seems like yesterday to me, um, but in fact, it's been 50 years. Right now, 50 years ago, we were between the Apollo 16 and the Apollo 17 mission. And, um, and now 50 years later, uh, NASA and the United States and a number of other countries are going forward to the moon and on to Mars together. So it's a very exciting time, very exciting time. I tell my students every year, you couldn't have come into a planetary science career at a better time. And sometimes I worry, well, geez, am I not telling the truth? No, no, it's always good. It gets better every year. So I encourage you all to think about these kinds of careers as well. And the strongest planetary scientist has the best Earth background. So let's step back and think a little bit about where we were before we went to the moon with Apollo. Pre-1959, for example, what do we know about the moon and what did we not know? Well, we didn't know its origin. We didn't know its age. We didn't know how it formed. We didn't know the nature of the surface, those dark areas, the maria uh, or the terra, the, the bright areas, the heavily cratered areas. And we didn't know the age of the surface. We didn't even know the origin of craters, were they volcanic or were they impact? This was hotly debated. And he, even more importantly, we didn't know what the other half of the moon looked like. We had not seen the far side of the moon. Just, just amazing, think about that. Uh, compare that to what we know now based on largely the Apollo program. Now, of course, at this time, there was a Cold War going on and the Soviet Union was doing some absolutely amazing planetary exploration, particularly with the moon, sending landers, rovers, returning samples robotically, um, sending orbiters and sending human rated missions as well. The engineers in the Soviet Union were just amazing and they did really, really great things. And so that's one of the things to really think about uh, because in fact, international endeavors and international cooperation and collaboration are critically important to the future. Of course, with the Cold War uh, between uh, basically primarily the United States and the Soviet Union, um, there was a big issue about leadership. And so uh, threatened, if you will, by the missile gap and by the Soviet successes on the moon and in space, uh, President John Kennedy in 1961 set the amazing goal to send human beings to the moon and return them safely by the end of the decade. You know, what? How are you going to do that? 1961. And I was a graduate student at this time um, at Brown University, and I was working on my PhD thesis, which was shallow marine carbonate environments in the early Devonian of the Appalachians. It had nothing to do with the moon, nothing to do with space. But I was looking for a job, and I saw this ad as portrayed here in the middle. It just had a picture of the moon, and it said, our job is to think our way to the moon and back. If you're interested, call this number. <laughs> How could you not be interested? How do you think your way to the moon and back? So I called the number, it was NASA headquarters. I interviewed for the position and I actually got the job. I didn't know anything about the moon, but nobody did. So basically we had to think our way to the moon and back. So over my career, I was able to utilize it early on working in the Apollo program, absolutely incredible launch vehicle sending three humans to the moon uh, a command and service module shown in the upper left, which in fact is um, had the three astronauts in it, but also lots of instruments in here that could be used to look at the moon from orbit. And then of course, the lunar module, which took the astronauts down to the surface so they explore the surface. And then an ascent version of this, which then came back up, rendezvoused and brought them back to the earth. This was an amazing capability. And my job from 1968 to 1973 was what questions do we want to answer from the moon? Where do we go? Site selection. Where do we go to answer those questions? And then when we land, what do we do when we get there? Okay. You know, you just don't say, okay, we're here. Uh, no, we, what do you do when you get there? Traverse planning. And also, how do we implement the science goals and objectives? That's where the science and engineering synergism comes in. And then, of course, just as with me, I knew nothing about the moon. I was learning very rapidly as we went along. But the astronauts also mostly were test pilots and they had no formal geological training. So we had to train the astronauts. Believe me, they were extremely good students, extremely bright and motivated people, which made the job relatively easy, but it took a lot of time. Field trips all over the planet and lots of different training sessions. We also had to simulate going to the moon. We had to go to Houston and the absolute, you know, the mission operations when the actual missions were taking place. And then when the astronauts came back, we would debrief how did it go? What did you do? What could we do to improve? And then we would put that into feed forward replanning of the subsequent missions, which could be happening in the next three or four months, maybe six months. 
So it was a very busy, busy job, to put it mildly. Um, <laughs> I always like to say it was before frequent flyer miles. If there had been frequent flyer miles, I would have enough miles to go to Pluto and back, trust me. But there weren't, unfortunately, at that time. So what did we do? People think, oh, Apollo landed on the moon, brought humans back. It was much more than that. It was much more than that. We had a four-pronged approach, surface science stations, surface exploration, orbital exploration, and then using the moon as a platform. Okay, we've got the moon, we're away from the atmosphere, we can look out into space and make observations that we can't make effectively on the earth. There was a huge range of science at all levels during Apollo. This is kind of like a secret in a way, it shouldn't be, but it is not well known. Um, people generally think that there was just one mission and you know we accomplished a national goal and then, and then stayed home, not the case at all. The other thing to realize is that um, there were precursor missions. Before Neil Armstrong put his foot down the first step on the moon, there were 21 robotic precursor missions in eight years. 21 missions in eight years. These were all designed to understand what's going on and what was going on in terms of the soil, in terms of the orbital link, to give us information for site selection and beyond. So I want to run through the different Apollo missions to illustrate exactly what the science and engineering synergism uh, uh, was able to accomplish. Uh, this was really important. Um, so I'll, I'll use this and come back to this template so you can see what happened as a function of time and how we were able to work with the engineers to increase the science capabilities. So Apollo 7, 8, 9, and 10 were precursor missions to test out the equipment, to try out the operations, et cetera. And they were all very successful. And then uh, uh, what I wanna do is to go through each of these steps here very briefly and show you how at each step of the way, we were able to uh, increase the capabilities in, in exploration uh, and return of science data. So first, of course, we wanted to land safely. That was critically important. Um, uh, we needed to exploit some, deploy some experiments and then collect rocks and soil. And of course, Apollo 11 on July 16th, 1969 was launched with a target site in the Eastern Maria here where the red arrow is. And that was designed uh, both because it was very smooth and, and ensured astronaut safety. Um, and also it was really interesting to try to date those Mari deposits and figure out how they form. So uh, as is well known on July 20th, 1969, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon. Uh, Neil was the first human to walk on the moon, uh, followed quickly by Buzz Aldrin. They set up scientific experiments like you can see in the foreground here and they explored a wide range of areas around the lunar module and of course over to West Crater. And indeed, um, the, note, note the 50 meter scale here. This is 50 meters and look at the traverses here. You'll see how with time that capability increased. And the astronauts were very well trained. They did a lot of experiments on the surface. Uh, they had had geological training. This is Neil and Buzz looking at rocks on one of our field trips to Meteor Crater. Um, they did a superb job uh, given the fact that it was the first mission to the moon. And they returned uh, a, a total of um, uh, essentially 21 kilograms, about 21 and a half kilograms of rocks and soils. They were out on the surface for only two hours and 30 minutes, uh, but they were able to collect a great set of samples. And indeed, the white materials in the soil were what gave us the idea about the lunar magma ocean. John Wood uh, looked at those soils and came up with that concept first. So we, even with Apollo 11, we learned a huge amount, but we wanted to increase the stay time on the lunar surface. A couple of hours was great, but we wanted to make it more than that. We wanted to increase the number of EVA periods. That's the time you go out onto the surface to two, not just one. <clears throat> and also Apollo 11 landed about a few kilometers downrange because of the roughness of some of the crater ejecta. And we wanted to demonstrate that we could land pinpoint we wanted to go to a specific point on the moon so we could go to difficult areas, rough areas, and land between the rough areas on smooth areas. And so on Apollo 12, uh, that was designed to accomplish these three goals. So on uh, uh, four months, four months later, after Apollo 11, Apollo 12 was launched to the moon and the landing site was in the Western Maria. How much different are the Maria on the surface? These appeared to have fewer craters. Are they younger? How much younger? We needed radiometric dates from these. And of course, the key here is that, uh, can somebody mute who's ever on there? Um, so the key here is that uh, Alan Bean and uh, Pete Conrad landed on the surface and they were able to, uh, in fact, 
land right next to the Surveyor 3 spacecraft. You can see here in the background the lunar module. We targeted for the Surveyor 3 spacecraft. They landed right next to it. A beautiful example of pinpoint landing. And then they had traverses all the way around here to Middle Crescent Head, Bench Crater, Surveyor Crater. And uh, they were very, very successful in analyzing the data, exploring different depths from crater ejecta, et cetera. And they had two EVAs, almost eight hours of time on the surface, three kilometers walking around on the surface, and almost 34 and a half kilograms of rocks increasing the capability. And these rocks were pretty amazing. Not only were they younger, but they also demonstrated from material thrown in from outside some very unique kinds of things that we had not at all uh, explored before. Of course, when the astronauts got back and when we debriefed Pete Conrad and Alan Bean, they said, we could really use like a wheelbarrow, like a, a truck to pull along with us so we could put our tools and all our samples along there. We could do much more if we had that capability. So we worked with the engineers and they designed like a little uh, wheelbarrow almost uh, to transport the samples and the tools, etc. And on Apollo 14, after the accident on Apollo 13, nine months after Apollo 13, the spacecraft was targeted to a very rough area in the Framora Formation, the ejecta from this giant basin here. Um, and so the astronauts, uh, essentially uh, Ed Mitchell and, and Alan Shepard landed in this very rough area. Take a look at the roughness you can see here. This is the ridges between the smooth landing site. And here they are exploring the surface of the moon. This is Al Shepard exploring the surface. And indeed, they set up a series of scientific instruments and used this mobile equipment transporter to carry all the materials around. And then it was very effective in increasing their capabilities. You can see the tracks of the mobile equipment transporter or MET uh, that going uh, from the lunar module up into the mountains here, the ridges. And they actually had nine hours on the surface, almost nine and a half hours, three or four kilometers just walking with a wheelbarrow and almost uh, 43 kilograms of, of the soil and rocks. So that was really amazing and uh, indeed, um, the next key thing that they found potentially is a rock they found on Apollo 14, which recently people have thought may contain a felsite class that was transported, blown off Earth early in its history. So we may actually have a piece of ancient Earth preserved uh, on the moon uh, from ejecta thrown off an impact uh, on the Earth. So this is the kind of exciting discovery that who would, who would have anticipated that? So the next thing we wanted to do was, in fact, get increase the number of EVA periods, go to higher latitudes, and provide mobility to reach distant targets. Uh, we really needed to not just walk around on the surface, but hey, why don't we have a car? Let's design a car. We work with the engineers to do all these things. And on six months after Apollo uh, 14, uh, Hadley, uh, the Apollo 15 mission was targeted to the Imbrium Basin Rim right here in the edge of this massive impact basin here. Uh, and the mission, to, in order to be successful, the astronauts had to do a plane change of their orbit. So if you're in equatorial orbit <clears throat> and you ascend to the surface, uh, you can in fact easily get to uh, back to the lunar module. But if you change your plane, it's much harder to get back to the lunar module. So this is something that we have, um, were able to do, the work together with the engineers and the astronauts. In addition, we needed to go down to uh, an abnormally steep descent profile down to the surface. And if we take a look here, these are the mountains. They're huge mountains, 14,000 feet high. And this rill was 900 meters deep and it required a much steeper uh, lunar module descent path. And the astronauts got into the simulator, hmm, tried it out a couple, we can do that. So the mission was targeted to this very complex area here. And in fact, as you can see, this was the first scientific expedition to the moon. Uh, basically, Commander Dave Scott shown here and Jim Irwin, the lunar module pilot, landed successfully. Look at these mountains in the background. They flew over those mountains, did a steep descent, and came down to the surface. And this, of course, was the car that they had tucked into this place in the lunar module and were able to pull out and open up and deploy. So this is pretty amazing. And you can see here as well that Apollo 15 Commander Dave Scott uh, he's sitting here waiting. You can see the traverse maps here, the geological traverse maps, uh, waiting to go. He's waiting to go. Jim Irwin's taking a picture, and they really went around the surface. They had three EVAs. They went out seven kilometers from the lunar module, 
and a total traverse of over 30 kilometers, and they collected 77 kilograms of rocks and soils. This is just amazing. I mean, just amazing. this was a scientific, the first scientific expedition to the moon. And the kinds of things that they found uh, were in fact really important. They found these discovered green volcanic beads, glass beads. Uh, you should listen to the transcripts and hear Dave Scott just excitedly. They're green, green glass. In 2011, um, about 40 years later, Alberta Saul, a, a, a geochemist in our labs at Brown, discovered water in these glass beads. This is a major discovery, not just at the time, but also 40 years later. These samples keep on giving. Uh, we also found the Genesis rock, which was really critical in understanding uh, the crust of the moon. And of course, we were able to look at rock layering here. Uh, very difficult to find on the moon, but study this. These are a series of lava flows. And then on the way back, Dave Scott was so excited about this that he stopped the lunar rover and he said, Houston, uh, I have a difficulty with my seatbelt. Houston was saying, oh, get back to the lunar module. You're running low on oxygen. Get back as soon as you can. Uh, and uh, yes, roger that, Houston, roger that. And he said, wait, I'm having trouble with my seatbelt. And oh, well, fix your seatbelt. We don't want you falling off. Dave got out of the lunar module. I'm sorry, out of the lunar rover, went over, collected this rock with all the holes in it because he knew that this represented gas in the molten rock that solidified and collected it and came back and said, okay, Houston, the seatbelt is fixed now. And okay, get back to the lunar module. And we all as scientists now call that the unauthorized stop, the seatbelt basalt. Okay, so he really knew what uh, the science was all about. And when Dave got back from the moon, he said, you know, Jim, it was so exciting doing the geology that I didn't even know I had my space suit on. Now that's, that's pretty remarkable. I think I'd be looking over my shoulder, making sure the earth was still there, checking my oxygen. Dave was like, I didn't even know I had my suit on. It was so much fun doing the geology. And of course, the next two were also very important scientific expeditions. Uh, nine months later, after Apollo 15, we landed in the highlands uh, to look for volcanic rocks. And in fact, when we were able to do this, Commander John Young and Charlie Duke went down to the surface and they were able, in fact, uh, to discover that, hey, it wasn't volcanic rock, it was basin and crater ejecta. This was a fundamental change in our thinking and they did a superb job, a superb job there. So when we take a look at this landing site, okay, there were three EVAs, they traversed 27 kilometers and returned almost 100 kilograms of rocks. So the next thing, of course, was to send a geologist as a member of the surface crew. Um, indeed, uh, eight months later, on Apollo 17, December 7th, 1972. Uh, in fact, Serenitatis Basin, uh, the dark mantling uh, uh, deposits were discovered. Uh, there were a whole series of things here that really changed our thinking about the moon, not young volcanism, but old volcanism. This is uh, Gene Cernan, uh, together with lunar module pilot geologist Jack Schmidt, landed on the surface and explored the surface in the lunar rover. Uh, you can see Gene and Jack here. Uh, lots of different scientific experiments access to huge boulders here that had rolled down the hill from these uh, steep mountainsides and indeed the orange glass, the orange pyroclastic glass that we thought might be very young, but turned out to be 3.7 billion years old. So this is very, very exciting. You can see here the lunar rover for scale. This is a huge block that rolled down and you can see it's been broken in two. And Jack, did a, Jack Schmidt did a superb job of in fact describing this and sampling it. So three EVAs, almost 35 kilometers, and return 111 kilograms of rocks and soils. So this is amazing. Three scientific expeditions to the moon, to be sure, building on the results of the earlier missions. And the important point is that it was the engineering and science synergism that enabled us to get more mobility, more stay time on the moon, a car on the moon to drive around, uh, and increase the capability as a function of time. But that wasn't all. The Apollo program was, in fact, uh, canceled after uh, these missions because of uh, the Vietnam War and other demands uh, on, uh, on the budget. Uh, but we had plans to send a rover vehicle to the next landing site. So the idea was, OK, if on Apollo 19, 20, and 21, we we're actually going to take the lunar rover, add a cart to the back of it, and remotely power it from the Earth to go from that landing site to the next landing site, which could be hundreds of kilometers away to interpolate between the landing sites. So lots of really good evidence for science and engineering synergism. So I think you can see from this successive landing safely on Apollo 11 
to, in fact, a major scientific set of expeditions to the moon in the latter part, how science and engineering synergism really works. So I really encourage you to get to know your engineering colleagues and engineers get to know your scientist colleagues, because to me, engineers make our scientific dreams a reality. And that's really critically important if we're to have success in exploring the new frontiers of space or Antarctica or anywhere else uh, in the solar system. So you can see here the evolution of exploration scientific return. This diagram shows the different um, landing. Uh, this, the, the, this is taking the traverses and putting them on a common base here and then looking at how far they went out here. You can see out to of the order of 10 or so kilometers for Apollo 17. And you can see, uh, in fact, Apollo 11 isn't even visible at this scale. So looking at the Apollo missions as a function of distance, the walking missions were like less than five kilometers. And with a rover, we were out to in excess of 30 kilometers. And the same for the return sample mass uh, for the Apollo 11, 12, and 14 missions, less than 40 kilograms. Uh, on the other hand, over 100 kilograms by the time Apollo 17. So you can see science and engineering synergism is really critical. So what are, what are the legacies of Apollo? What do we learn and what are the exciting things that really have changed our perspective here? I want to go through a list of these, if you will, uh, these six missions and what they have done to change our view. Um, I'm going to touch on these very briefly, each of them, and I've sent a PDF of this uh, presentation to um, uh, your, your hosts. And I think, you know, if the, I'm happy to have that shared if anybody wants to work through this, but I'll just touch on these to give you an idea how across the scientific spectrum, how the Apollo program really changed our thinking. The first one is return rock and soil samples in geological context. You know, when we think about meteorites, we don't actually know exactly where they came from. So we studied them without much geological context. But the Apollo missions, we were able to get you know, exactly where these came from, associate them with materials and craters, uh, crustal materials, et cetera, and put them in the geological context. And indeed, each of these sites was chosen on the basis of key scientific questions. So the scientific samples that were collected related to those fundamental questions, geological context. For example, we could look at big basins like the Oriental Basin and say, hey, you know, we chose Apollo 17 because it's right on inner ring. We chose Apollo 15 because it's on the outer ring. And we've sampled the ejecta with Luna 20, uh, Luna Apollo 14, and Apollo 16. And now we can study these things in this context. So returning samples uh, in the context of uh, the geological environment is critically important. But we learned a huge amount about lunar geophysics. Geophysics is critical to understanding a planet as a whole. Seismology, heat flow, and magnetism. For example, um, we learned that the moon was made up of chemical layers like the earth, crust, mantle, and core, but also mechanical layers, a lithosphere, an asthenosphere. Uh, we learned that the chemical layers were unstable with time uh, because the magma ocean formed. Uh, some of these uh, residues from that were thermally and um, chemically uh, negatively buoyant, and so they foundered with time. And this sets the stage for later lunar thermal evolution. We, the concept of the lunar magma ocean, which in fact is due to the accretional energy associated with the early, um, early impact bombardment, uh, this was a hypothesis formulated by John Wood at Apollo 11, um, and the late stage accretional heating uh, really produces uh, the major setting for early planetary crust. We've applied this to other planets very successfully, including the Earth. Uh, we also learned a concept of primary, secondary, and tertiary crust. Primary is what we've talked about here with the magma ocean. Secondary is partial melting of the mantle. And tertiary crust is essentially recycling of these first two. Uh, we see that in terms of plate tectonics on the Earth. But do we have any similar types of things on other planetary bodies? So this is critical. Uh, we also learned the lithosphere, uh, the outer rigid layer, if you will, the thermal boundary layer. We learned that this thickened with a function of time and became less heterogeneous with time. So if you think about the moon, uh, it doesn't have plate tectonics. It's essentially a one plate planet and it loses heat conductively as a function of time. Very different than the earth, which loses heat by plate tectonics. So if we think about this, for example, the earth is losing heat by planetary recycling. Uh, EO, the innermost of the Galilean satellites, loses heat by volcanic heat pipes. It actually effectively transfers the heat to the surface. But the Moon, Mercury, and Mars, um, in fact, 
lose heat by lithospheric conduction. They're just good radiators because the surface area to volume relationship uh, is so high, ratio is so high. So this gives us the opportunity to apply this to other planetary bodies. What about Mercury? What about Mars? What about Venus, the most Earth-like of the planet? Where does it fit in this? this? The moon forms the basis for, in fact, even asking that question. We also learned about the role of impact cratering and its effect on the structure. The impact bombardment can produce a, a soil layer that's 10 kilometers thick and also uh, have a huge effect on the porosity of the crust as a function of depth. This was from the seismic data. Um, the heat flow experiments were also critically important. We found out that there was a place on the moon in the northwest part of the moon, the Procolarum creep terrain, that had a super abundance of radioactive material compared to the far side and other parts of the moon. How does that work? Why is that the case? What causes that enhancement in these radioactive layers? It's a really important fundamental aspect and an unanswered question about the moon. We also learned uh, something of the Earth's, uh, the moon's magnetic field. The moon turns out not to have much of a field today at all, but it has samples which are magnetized. So the origin of crustal anomalies, uh, what are they doing there? We see crustal anomalies, we see samples that are, um, that are uh, magnetic in, in nature, and we're trying to understand the nature and evolution of the lunar magnetic field. How did it vary with time? This is why going back and getting more samples is important. The other thing is that we learn how to understand planetary geological processes. Now, of course, we study geological processes on the Earth, but we, we tend to think of them in a very special uh, Earth-centered way, a Terra-centric way, if you will. But on the moon, uh, it's really something we don't usually think about, which is impact cratering. The moon is a fundamental laboratory for basic understanding of how impact cratering works. We see little pits on the rocks. We see differences in morphology as a function of increasing diameter as the basins excavate into deeper and deeper material. We see changes in morphology that have given us an idea about what's going on with the response of this. So we can't get to all these other cratered surfaces of planetary bodies, and virtually all of them are, um, but we can see these on the moon. So this is also really, really important. And we look upon this laboratory as a way to um, really increase our understanding. Uh, we can see, for example, the crater to basin transition here. How do you go from an impact crater to a basin? What's going on at depth in terms of temperature and pressure? What's going on in terms of collapse of the crater? This is all really critical information for all planetary bodies that we can actually understand uh, from investigating uh, the moon. And of course, lunar volcanism. This is one of my passions, if you will, it's to try to understand volcanism. We see beautiful lava flows on the surface in Mare Imbrium, a whole host of features that we've been able to actually link to these sinuous rills like the Hadley Rill and Apollo 15. We've been able to link uh, to the surface. We see steep-sided domes. This looks like a crater, but it's actually a dome. It's 20 kilometers across and about 1,100 meters high. It's very viscous volcanism. Is that a granite on the moon? This is clearly more basaltic in nature. What is the differentiation and how do you fit that together? So returning the samples, not just the surface geology, but looking at the samples has enabled us to understand the origin and basically generation, ascent, and eruption of magma, molten rock on the moon, primarily basaltic. And it is this collective information from the samples return, petrologic studies, petrogenetic studies, uh, geochemical studies, and geological studies that have been able us to put together a really good model for the generation of molten rock at depth and its transport to the surface and eruption on the surface. So this is a real, real gift from Apollo and indeed can be applied to all the planetary bodies. Looking at the crater frequency distribution, we can calibrate that by bringing samples back from various geological units, Apollo 11, Apollo 12, for example, um, enable us to calibrate that um, cratering chronology curve. And most recently, China has return with the Chang'e 5 mission, beautiful mission, incredible data. It landed in this orange area here, and it dated it at about two, 2 billion years ago, which helped to recalibrate what we thought was the flux curve for the moon. So getting the samples back and dating them in the laboratory is critical to understanding the history of volcanism on the moon, and in fact, application to other bodies. And again, thinking about the tectonics on the moon, do we have folded mountain belts? Do we have uh, great rift valleys, et cetera. Well, because the moon's 
a one plate planet and has a continuous lithosphere, it's losing its heat largely by uh, lithospheric conduction. When we look at this, uh, we can take a look here at what happens when all these Mari basalts come out, they load that lithosphere. Instead of having lateral tectonics, like we see on the earth, for example, we actually have vertical tectonics. We have loading uh, of the lavas onto the crust of the moon, you know, up to four or five kilometers thick in the middle. This puts a load on the moon. We have lithospheric flexure. We have gravins, wrinkle ridges, and we can actually date, as Sean Solomon and I did quite a while ago, uh, the evolution of these loads and think about tectonics on the moon and other one plate planets, Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, how they operate. So this is a real insight from the Apollo data. And of course, I mentioned the lunar and planetary chronology. We can build up uh, this whole chronology here to help us understand what the global flux is. That is to say, the number of impact craters coming in, number of impact projectiles coming in as a function of time. This is really important for understanding the solar system evolution. Uh, we can calibrate the cratering chronology like we did with the Chang'e 5 samples. And then we can extrapolate this to other planetary bodies. That's critical because all the ages on the other planets, we don't have samples taken in place. We don't know actually what that is. We have to extrapolate from the moon uh, to these other planetary bodies. So the moon becomes even more important in that context. And the origin of the moon, where does that thing come from? It's the really unusual satellite. You know, it's the biggest satellite in the solar system. Uh, you know, what's going on there? Um, uh, we take a look here uh, at the moon. Uh, it's uh, essentially, uh, we've, we've discovered that in fact, it formed from the impact of a Mars-sized object into the early Earth, and the ejector from that appears to have formed the moon. It recollected in orbit and collected to form the moon. And of course, many people said, oh, gee, that has to, that explains why the moon is so dry. Um, and indeed, it, it, it was thought to after Apollo, thought to be dry. But Alberto Sol, once again, uh, was able to look at the uh, lunar magma glasses and find volatiles in them. And that completely changed the picture, not of how the moon formed from an impact of a Mars-sized object, but how it actually, was it one impact, two impacts? Was it oblique? How do you account for the fact that something that intense uh, did not get rid of all the volatiles. So that helped us to refine the models of uh, the early uh, formation of uh, the impact into that body and also uh, the formation of the moon. So also, you know, we find that this gives us a context for early history of the earth. This is really important. If we take a look at the earth um, shown on the left here, of course, um, if we look at the history of the earth as a function of the um, like a clock. Okay, the history origin of the Earth starts here, and then we have the present day. If we take a look at the percentage of the Earth formed at different times in that history, the ocean basins form two thirds of the surface of the Earth, and that in fact provides us with data that really gives us recent history. And the continents, you know, provide more information back in time, of course, but they really don't provide detailed data on the first half of solar system history in ways that we can understand the last half of solar system history. So, wow, we're in big trouble trying to understand where we're going if we don't understand where we've been. But the planets, and particularly the moon, provides, in fact, that view. This is what is going on in early history. Big impact basins, impact craters, early volcanism, magma oceans, all of these things can now be brought into the picture of the Earth's formative years, which indeed help us to figure out not just the history of the Earth, but where we're going in the future. This is a real gift from Apollo. Finally, this, uh, not, not finally, a couple, th there's a template for planetary accretion and bombardment history. If we take a look here, for example, um, the, the, the flux, very high early on, decreasing to low now. We don't know whether there are big peaks in here or not. And the dating of these surfaces of the moon and counting of craters really gives us an idea of what's going on. And one of the goals of upcoming sample uh, return is, in fact, the South Pole Aiken Basin. This is a huge 2,400 kilometer diameter basin, and it is one of the earliest basins that we know about. So we're hoping to be able to date that basin and understand uh, the chronology of the solar system from this as well. So the moon really keeps on giving in all these ways. It's also a cornerstone. Everything we learn about the moon, we can apply to, in fact, these other planetary bodies. 
you can see from all the lessons we have here that it helps us to understand Venus, Mars, Mercury, um, and indeed the Earth itself. It's a cornerstone for understanding. So the more we can study these, the better off we can appreciate what's going on on our own home planet and the family of Earth-like planets that are shown here. Indeed, if you think about it then, we can apply this chronology, do geological maps of the Moon, Mercury, uh, and, and Mars, and indeed begin to understand the early history and compare it to the large Earth-like planet like Venus um, and, and uh, other planetary bodies and exoplanets. So this is, this is really, really important, the data from Apollo. Finally, I want to point out that we use the moon as a platform and a template. Uh, so, okay, we really want to understand the moon, but it is a platform away from the Earth, away from the radio noise of the Earth, away from Earth's atmosphere. And as with Johannes Geiss's experiment from Switzerland on Apollo 11, uh, basically we can study the solar wind, that, that uh, uh, foil, aluminum foil uh, flag there, if you will, uh, really is collecting solar wind and helps us to understand what's going on, how the space environment uh, it, it actually uh, affects materials on the surface and affected the Earth early on and even today. So it's used as a platform. And of course, even more so, George Carruthers, uh, uh, a, a very excellent scientist from uh, the Naval Research Laboratory in the United States, uh, developed a camera here which was deployed by Apollo 16. You can see it in the background there. Um, and this is a far UV camera and a spectrograph, which actually took pictures uh, of uh, the earth and different bodies at different wavelengths. And indeed is a precursor for the kinds of observatories we will in fact be building on the moon in the future, particularly on the far side in the radio quiet area. So basically we've really, we've really come a long way. And the Apollo program was a fundamental demonstration of the importance of science and engineering synergism, as well as really collecting the kinds of samples that can really fill in our understanding of not just the moon, but the other planetary bodies, and indeed the early history of the Earth. So I want to just say that, um, uh, close by saying that, you know, why do we need to go back to the moon? Don't we have enough information on the moon? <laughs> and the answer, of course, is uh, no, we need to go back. Um, there are many unanswered fundamental questions about the moon. Uh, as I pointed out, these provide real insights into early Earth history. And it's a foundation for understanding the other planets and satellites. Everything we learn about the moon informs us about these other planetary bodies, which are, which are harder to, uh, to explore. Um, it also enhances this kind of exploration. It enhances national pride and prestige. Uh, you know, pride is how we view ourselves. Prestige are how others view us. Any country that's engaged in space exploration, India, uh, ESA, Japan, United States, Russia, uh, you, you know, they're, they're all uh, building on their own national capabilities and they're building pride in how they can accomplish things and prestige uh, you know, in, in their own people, but also prestige in how um, others view them. This really enhances international cooperation. This is critically important. I'm very honored to have been a member of the team of the uh, Moon Mineralogy Mapper on Chandrayaan-1. And it was just an amazing mission and learning and learning from my Indian colleagues and collaborating and cooperating with them was absolutely fantastic. It also provides a challenging but relatively easy access. You can get to the moon and get back relatively easy. We can do both human and robotic exploration. Both of these are possible, which helps us to understand how we would approach uh, going to Mars, for example. What's the ratio of human and robotic exploration capabilities? And of course, for any country, it's a driver for technological development. If you can send something to the moon, then you know you can develop various kinds of technologies that will help improve life on, on the earth, life in your own country, uh, and applications to a whole host of different kinds of uh, scientific and technological capabilities, global warming, other types of things like that, energy resources, water resources. It also encourages science and engineering synergism, as I mentioned. If we can get engineers and scientists to work together, we can solve Earth's problems as well as planetary problems. And again, for me, this was very true for myself. It was an inspiration for me to work on this. This is what brought me into this kind of uh, career, uh, inspiration for youth and a basis for enhancing diversity. You know, in the 1960s, uh, sadly, I mean, it just it was the way it was. It was largely a male culture. Um, men were the most uh, active participants. 
Uh, there were some women, there were some people of color, but they were really underrepresented significantly. So if we were so successful in Apollo, think of what we can do with engaging the other 50% of the population, women, for example, and minorities, and also the rest of the world, the talent that exists outside of the United States or your own country. Think about that. Think of what we can do. So it's an inspiration, I think, for everyone. And the future really is international coordination and cooperation. Coordination means we talk and we work together to plan our own missions. Cooperation means actually working together like we did on Chandrayaan-1 and fly instruments on each other's spacecraft and so on. So I think that's the future. And I hope through Apollo, I've been able to show you uh, that that's what we hope to do in the future. And I look forward uh, to helping all of us uh, develop these kinds of careers that are so rewarding as we did in Apollo. Thank you very much. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, Professor Head, thank you very, very much for actually giving us uh, a very, uh, uh, you know, organized overview of what Apollo was all about and what it actually achieved. Uh, uh, I think we can uh, start off the question answer session now. Uh, uh, if we have uh, any questions, I think, unless it gets very noisy and uh, problematic, I think we can directly ask your questions and I'll just moderate them in case Professor Head is not able to follow. So uh, uh, you can please begin. If you have a question, you can start off. Uh, you can just mention your name in the chat box and I'll then I'll call your name out and you can just ask your question. Uh, right, so uh, uh, Professor Sen, we have the, uh, uh, Professor, uh, uh, head, we have the first question. So can I, uh, I'll just read it out. It's in the chat box. So this is uh, Ritwik, you can go ahead and ask. Unmute yourself, go ahead and ask. Right, maybe his uh, mic is not working. So what uh, the question is, what is the significance of Genesis rock in the Apollo 15 lunar samples? This is a very good question. Genesis rock was um, what we had hoped to see by going to the rim of the basin was the deepest ejecta from the Embrian basin. So this is a huge impact basin. And we knew that the larger the basin size, the more it would excavate deeper yeah, into the surface and indeed bring up material from, from great depth. So we trained the astronauts to look for rocks that had uh, large crystals, large crystals, because that meant they had been at depth and they grew slowly and grew to large sizes. And Dave Scott, bless his, <laughs> he was amazing. Okay, all the astronauts were amazing. Dave Scott from about 10 meters away, looked over and saw twinning in the plagioclase, twinning in the plagioclase, it's shining and shined up. And he said, Houston, I think we found what we came for. He recognized it instantly. And uh, that's a good geologist right there, okay. So it, it did show us what the fundamental nature of uh, the anorthosites and, the, you know, and, and where we could study the relationships of the crystals and the other minerals and provide a really fundamental information on what the crust of the moon, the primary crust of the moon looked like. Thanks, uh, Ahead. I mean, uh, uh, Kumarasan, we'll just take your question a while later. Shujoy uh, from our department, Professor Shujoy Ghosh has a question. Shujoy, can you ask directly, please? Yeah. Uh... Uh, Professor Head, it was an uh, excellent talk, and uh, uh, I'm an experimentalist, and uh, 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 I'm interested in a uh, role of volatile in the deep interior of Earth. And recently, we started some experiment uh, on uh, this lunar magma ocean and this kind of uh, topics. We are recently uh, started experiment. So you touch a topic of this water in the lunar interior. I know this Alberto Sal's this, this uh, discovery of water in uh, lunar uh, some rocks. So uh, do you have any idea about role of CO2 in the lunar uh, interior? What is your opinion on the role of CO2 in the lunar interior? Yeah, the, 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 this, of course, has a lot to do with what the uh, oxygen fugacity is. And so, you know, I mean, part of the problem is that it looks like CO2 is, comes out as carbon monoxide in part. That was originally what was thought to be propelling, if you will, um, the, um, the uh, uh, pyroclastic eruption. So we've been looking at theoretical treatments about speciation of various gases, including CO2, CO, SO2, and H2O in the in the um, uh, segregation, if you will, of these volatiles and their relative abundance as a function of 
uh, decreasing pressure. Um, if you send me an email, I can send you a couple of recent papers. It's just James underscore head at Brown EDU with a, it, specific questions, and I can forward these to you as well. It's very important, and I think good experimental work like you're talking about uh, is is critically important. Okay. Right. So, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, Shujar, yeah, go on. Yeah. You want to, con you have a follow up oh, question? Thank quickly? you. Yeah. I, I will contact. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. All right. So, uh, uh, Kumarasan, would you like to ask your question directly, or should I read it out? You can if you can unmute and ask. Or would you? I'll just read out his uh, question then. Uh, uh, so his question is: uh, Volcanic glass beads. They are subjected to space weathering process. Are they subjected to space weathering processes? What changes can you can you uh, uh, did you anticipate would happen to them? Well, the yeah the the volcanic glasses um, mostly. If they sit literally on the surface, they will be uh, subject to space weathering. But the kinds of things that Dave Scott discovered, like for example, on Apollo 15, they were in, in um, aggregated clods, sort of like, so they were all together. So they actually were not welded together. They were just uh, poorly cemented together. And they've been protected from space weathering because they were at depth. A little crater that Dave discovered uh, actually excavated these from depth. So they hadn't been exposed to space weathering very long. Um, so, however, looking at those fresh, you know, fresh, they're 3 billion years old, but fresh materials, uh, we were able to discover, the scientists were able to discover uh, surface correlated gases, okay, uh, volatiles. And so one of the things that we've been working on, Professor Saul and others have been working on is, what is the distribution of volatiles from the outside uh, to the inside using much more modern techniques than were available at the beginning of the Apollo program. Uh, so it's a really critical thing. And we try to look at those that haven't been altered by space weathering. I mean, I think the space weathering, uh, you know, one thing is that it can add materials that make it look like more water exists. So we try to compare those that probably were exposed to space weathering to those that weren't to try to sort out, is water being added by the space weathering process? Okay. Uh, the next question is from Dijesh Rai at PRL. Uh, Dijesh, do you want to ask it directly? Should I read it from the chat box? If you if you can ask you uh, directly, no problem. Okay, I think there's some problem with uh, people from outside the institute. Okay, so what's uh, well? He's thank you for your talk. Uh, he's actually just asked a, a, a sort of a, uh, what should I say? It's a, it's a question of what the strategy should be. So manned missions to moon will always be expensive and these will probably last for a few days only, unless there is a plan for building of the permanent lunar base. So once one lands on the moon, what should be the priority in your opinion? Should it be scientific research? Should it be lunar mining or should we promote tourism? Uh, it's what do you think with your long experience of, uh, you know, lunar, uh, of being involved on the uh, on lunar research. Well, I, I, you know, I'm a scientist, so I, but I had, but I worked in Apollo. So there were national goals and objectives, and then there were scientific goals and objectives. And the scientific goals and objectives were really important. Uh, they, they really ruled the day, uh, you know, once we had successfully been able to, okay, we can land, now we can explore. Okay, so that that's critically important. And I think those kinds of things will absolutely be uh, topmost in priority uh, for future human lunar exploration. That certainly is the way the Artemis program is going at the present time. On the other hand, we want to stay longer. We want to have a base and that requires resources. So, you know, that requires water. Okay, so we're hoping that there's water in the polar regions, um, you know, in, in permanently shadowed areas that has been sequestered there and may be available for for, uh, you know, I would say mining, okay? But, but before we drink that water, I really wanna see what the chemical composition is, not just because, because I don't wanna drink it till I know that, but I also wanna see, this is a record, a record of the volatile history of the solar system. So it's an incredibly valuable scientific resource. And before we use it uh, to be crude, well, you know, to use it for washing our hands, uh, we, we, we really want to be able to study it in detail. So I think scientific priorities are important, but if we're going to stay on the moon for any length of time, which is the plan, then we'll need to look at resources like water. In Antarctica, for example, when we fly into our fuel areas and the dry valleys and get dropped by helicopters, we don't take 
cans of water because we know from the orbital images that there are patches of snow and ice there. And we actually just go out with a shovel and a bag and fill it full of ice and bring it back and heat it up for our drinking water uh, and uh, our wash water. And uh, so, you know, it's a little bit the same on the moon. We like to be able to have that capability to not have to bring water all the way from the earth, but to use it for uh, for those purposes for permanent bases. And of course, you can also use it maybe to make rocket fuel. So all of these things are important. I think any commercial development or tourist development, you know, maybe is, is, is more in the one or two more decade uh, after, you know, time scale after we really learn how uh, to live on the moon. Right. Uh uh, we have another strategy-based question. This is from Nilanjan Dasgupta at Presidency University, works on the moon. Uh, he's asking that given that funds are a crunch, right, and as time passes, we see less and less money come being allocated for research. So does it make more sense to explore the moon or continue exploring the moon or to explore small bodies? Uh, according to you, which should be the priority? And uh, because if you take the full gamut of scientific issues that are related to the origin of the solar system, which do you think would yield uh, better dividends, uh, concentrating on the small bodies or concentrating on the on the moon? Well, it's 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 sort of like, you know, you can put it in the context of uh, uh, economics and say, uh, well, if you're going to invest, uh, you need to have a balanced portfolio. You can't just do all. Oh, I'm going to invest in oil only. Uh, I'm going to invest in mining only. I mean, you you really have to have a balanced portfolio because, in fact, we're learning from all of these. Translating that into a scientific parlay, parlance, if you will, we learn from all of these. And so, if we ignored small bodies, um, that would be ridiculous. These are the building blocks. The comets and the asteroids are the building blocks of the planets. We really need to understand those. And I think NASA has done a really good job of balancing this priority. Uh, you know, fortunately, we're 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 a, a, a relatively wealthy nation, so we can afford to have a balanced priority. I think people, this is the importance of scientific cooperation and coordination. Uh, you know, some some countries won't have the resources to have a diverse portfolio, but they can work with all the countries to see where um, they can make a big contribution. Okay, and maybe work and say, okay, look, if you do less investment in this, we can do that. And then together as scientists and, and residents of the earth, <laughs> you know, we can have a better picture of what's going on. Uh, so there's no simple answer, but the United States relies on the scientific expertise of the uh, National Academy of Sciences to develop decadal surveys where they um, make a prognosis about what are the big issues, what are the big questions in the future, and what are their recommendations for what should be done in terms of uh, scientific issues and, and mission priorities. So that's very helpful as well. Right. Uh, we have a follow-up question from uh, about the glass beads. This is from Kavish Madhan. Uh, he's asking whether the green glass beads were composed entirely of olivine or was it a mixture of different mafic minerals? And uh, in that case, can you explain the association of water with the discovery of the volatile minerals here? Not sure what he means by the second one, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I think you know, um, the, the, the answer is they're, they're complex uh, uh, geochemistry, you know, uh, they're not just olivine. Um, I, I think the, the question about the, um, uh, so when we look at the generation and ascent and eruption of molten rock, you know, the idea is, of course, you decrease pressure as a function of uh, uh, proximity to the surface. The closer you get to the surface, the less rocks are on top, the decrease in pressure makes the volatiles, the gases in the molten rock come out. And that's that's great because what it is, is uh, it, it tells us what these volatiles are when we take a look. So we've done a lot of work theoretically thinking about the importance of the volatiles and breaking up the molten rock as it comes out on the surface. And we've developed the capability to see what the distribution of volatiles might be, the predictions for how far the, the uh, uh, pyroclastic ejecta should be um, distributed around the vent. So uh, we actually have some geological potential evidence for um, what that should look like. And we're finding that, you know, we can we can estimate the amount of volatile content. We may be even able to estimate the types of volatiles based on these uh, configurations. So this is something a robotic rover, if it went to one of these dark 
pyroclastic deposits and move from the outside in, it could probably not only help understand the mineralogy, but also to help understand the grain sizes and, and, and basically deconvolve that complex signal of all the gases working together as the magma undergoes decreasing pressure. So it's, it's a very exciting thing because then it's part of the synergism of working together with all the different scientific uh, techniques. Thank you. So uh, we have a uh, question from Shumit Patak, who's actually working on the moon, on the flow fractured craters, basically. Sumit, uh, do you want to ask it directly? Sumit, we can see your hand, but I, uh, you've unmuted, but we can't hear you. Yeah, can't hear you. You're still, the volume is low. Hello. Yeah, yeah, go on. First of all, uh, thank you so much, sir, for this excellent talk. It's a great opportunity for all of us. Uh, sir, right now I'm uh, working in my PhD as a kind of PhD topic, uh, the mineralogical characterization of lunar flow fracture craters. And in doing that, we have go through lots of your papers as well as Jodwick's papers. Uh, so, sir, I have one question about that, but uh, there are lots of FFCs are present in other rocket planets. So, uh, what is there any difference in the formation of these FFCs in other parts of uh, rocket planetary areas, or they are just like the same happen in the lunar cases? Yeah, it's, it's it's a very good question, and and we do in fact uh, see a lot of differences in the abundance of floor fractured craters uh, on the moon. They're very common. Well, you know, there there are a lot of them on the moon, as you know. Um, but uh, we don't see very many, I, I don't, we see only one example potentially on Mercury, for example. Um, we may be bit better able to see these with the Bepi Colombo data coming in uh, in the near future, but I, I suspect that there aren't as many. Uh, on Mercury, that's one thing. On uh, the surface of Venus, we don't see very many at all. Most of the craters are pristine impact craters. Um, there are only about a thousand impact craters, so you know, it appears that they form after the volcanism. So that may be one reason we don't see many floor fractured craters. And then of course on Mars, we should see them, uh, but there are only a few and they're not quite the same as the ones on the moon. So I think it has to do with differences in the characteristics of the crust. And also, you know, when the magma is coming up, of course, when does it stall and create a, um, a sill, if you will, as you know, and uh, maybe those depths are different if they're deeper on, on you know, Mars, for example, um, then in fact, uh, you, you wouldn't see the floor fractured craters. So keep, keep going with that research and asking that question because it's really critical uh, to think much more about this because the floor fractured craters, as you know, are a clue uh, to a lot of things about the planetary history. And if you can uh, establish that signal, it would be really, really critical. So good luck and please keep me posted on your work. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Jantapati of Allahabad University is also does planetary work. Janta, would you like to uh, ask uh, directly or do you want me to read it out? Uh, well, I, I think there's a problem. So I'll read out his question. Uh, he says like uh, large terrestrial impact craters which have uh, voluminous pseudotachylites. On the moon, we are yet to discover similar melt dice. Uh, would you like to comment on that? It's a good. It's a good point. I think the uh, the development of the pseudotachylites. That's a really important question in planetary uh, cratering physics. Um, you know, we we don't understand uh, exactly how these big basins collapse, and maybe it's the pseudotachylites uh, when they're still molten, for example, injected injected um, melt into um, the substructure, which causes these big collapses. It's a big question, but we haven't really explored the interior of those kinds of craters. So I suspect that um, that we, we just simply haven't gotten to the point where we can have access to the pseudotachylites. This is one of the key things that in renewed exploration of the moon, I think can help us with. Um, it's also possible that of course, um, you know, we have them in our sample collection, but we just don't recognize them. So I think, you know, uh, developing criteria for distinguishing pseudotachylites from other types of impact melts, we certainly have a lot of evidence for impact melts in the sample collection. You know, which of the pseudotachylites? How do we, 
recognize those and where do we fit those back into the cratering thing? It's really important research. And I hope you keep me posted on your, your thinking on that. It's very important. Right, so among the other questions we have, there's one other from Ritwik, uh, since there are no other questions from anybody else yet. So I'll just quickly ask this. So are there any plans for landing on the lunar highlands on the far side in the upcoming Artemis mission? Uh, how difficult would it be to land on the rough terrain without direct communication from the home station? Well, I think you don't want to land uh, 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 without direct communications or at least indirect communications with the home station. I think. You know, we, we actually thought about this in Apollo. We thought maybe we might, might be able to land in Tsiolkovsky on the far side, but that requires a communications relay satellite. And at that time it was viewed as too, uh, <laughs> not so much too expensive, but too dangerous. That is, if they were on the far side of the moon and the relay satellite didn't work, then they'd be in real, real problem, real trouble. But the Chinese have um, in fact uh, been able to um, put into orbit a relay satellite, communication satellite, and demonstrated that it's it's possible and feasible. And that enabled them to land uh, the Chang'e 4 mission uh, in the far side, in the middle of the South Pole Aiken Basin. And uh, so they have the capability to do that. It requires a, a relay satellite. The United States could do that uh, with the Artemis program, uh, and anyone can do it in the future. Uh, you know, it, this is a good reason for international scientific cooperation and collaboration maybe we could share um, the Chinese communication satellite uh, so that we didn't have to send one for each country, but rather we, we work on scientific collaboration um, uh, to uh, in fact uh, share those resources. So uh, the Artemis mission will land in the South Circumpolar region, uh, but it will be uh, essentially uh, in visual communication, uh, direct communication uh, with Earth uh, capabilities at the present time. Maybe in the future, um, the communication satellites will enable us to move further away out of direct communication with the Earth. Right. Uh, there's no other questions. I have one, uh, a couple of questions for myself. Uh, if, if you're up to it, then uh, sure. should I? Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, this is a very basic question about the moon in general, which I've not never really understood. Uh, the, the, the highlands are an outer city crust, and they're probably the oldest bits of the crust that you can see there. And you've got the Mares, which are younger, and they've, they've got the, the basalts. Uh, now, uh, the anorthos sites, as we know them, are on Earth are, are plutonic rocks. And uh, to expose them on the surface, so you have a lot of, on Earth, you have surface processes which can remove any other rocks that might be there on top. So you expose that stuff. So on the moon, uh, you don't have a, I mean, what I, we don't have surface processes of that sort. So is it just the regolith that's covering it? Or I mean, how have we exposed plutonic rocks on the surface? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And that puzzled everybody at the beginning. You know, how do you get an orthocytes on the surface of the moon when in fact our terrestrial experience is that they're plutonic in nature? And the, the answer is that, that nobody had an idea about how this magma ocean works. So basically, instead of being plutonic, uh, the plagioclase is the lighter mineral, and when you melt hundreds of kilometers or many tens to hundreds of kilometers of the outer surface, it floats to the top. And so that's why it's on the top. And then the, the uh, more dense minerals like the ilmenite and um, the, the stuff that forms the mantle now, the, the, the uh, uh, pyroxenes, et cetera, they, they sink. And so that's, that's why it's a primary kind of like density stratification which is obviously, as you point out, very different from uh, plutonic rocks that we see from these major intrusions at depth on the Earth that need unroofing to expose them. So there's no surface uh, melt quench layer, or never was anything on on the surface. No, I, I think there was. I, no, I think you're absolutely right. Your intuition is absolutely absolutely right on the money. I think you you would you definitely have a quench layer, but then impacts continue to uh, hit the surface and. You know, is the quench layer uh, a mixture of everything? And then the, the plagioclase is just below that. Uh, unfortunately, there are so many impacts and the regolith, the big regolith, the mega regolith is so thick, you know, many kilometers that it's probably all mixed up in that. So, you know, this requires essentially, um, you know, I don't know, there's, we have, we have this kind of metaphor of like finding a needle in a haystack, uh, you know, it's not so easy. And I suspect, you know, that's what we need to do with the sample collection is to see if we can find 
evidence for this quench layer. Uh, it has to be there because um, the outer boundary layer, you know, you're cooling stuff to space. So there has to have been a quench layer before the complete segregation of the anorthositic crust, et cetera. So I, I would say that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really critical question. Uh, and I don't, I, you know, I'm not a petrologist per se, but, but I, I know people are thinking about that, but I don't know that there's been much progress in actually identifying samples that might have formed this quench layer. I'll just end with one final question. Uh, do you think the moon's thermally dead? So the interior is completely, uh, I mean, there's no convection or anything at all, and it's its just static now, it's just cooling off. No, I think I think the moon is still is still active. It's not active in the way we think about it, but you know, we know that the moon still has uh, moonquakes, for example. I mean, they're highly correlated with the, um, it's highly correlated with the, the orbit of the moon, uh, but it, what that's doing is it's it's kind of like massaging the moon. Um, the, the lithosphere is about a thousand kilometers deep, thick, if you will. Right. And the 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 radius is about 700, 1734. So <laughs> that's a really thick lithosphere. Imagine trying to subduct that, not going to happen, right? right. But mm -hmm. at the same time, there's still activity there. It's still partially molten in the interior. I think it's it takes it takes a huge amount of overpressure to get any of that to the surface. That's why I think there's very little evidence for volcanism today. But people have argued that some of these volcanic features, um, there's a set of features uh, that, that have been dated to uh, uh, less than 100 million years old. Um, it's a big debate about whether they actually represent the date of emplacement of the rock or they're just unusual uh, magmatic foams that don't preserve craters. Uh, but in general, the moon, I think, at depth is still active. It's just a question of, you know, how that's manifested. So it would really help to have more seismometers. And that's a good example of what many countries could do is to work together to put seismometers on different parts of the moon. We desperately need more information about that for the, for the deep interior, just to, just to answer the questions you're asking. Right. Thank you. We we have a sudden spurt of three questions. Is it okay with you? I mean, uh, sorry. Go, let me just uh, real quick here. I'll be right back. Stand by one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't matter. Very sorry about that. That was CGTN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, would you be able to take three quick questions? I mean, these are the just Absolutely. three on the box. Yeah. Absolutely. OK, so the first one is from a colleague of mine. Professor, he's a geophysicist, Professor uh, W.K. Mohanty. Uh, William, William, can you can you just uh, ask directly? Yeah, um, uh, Professor Head, it's a, a very, very nice presentation. We learn lots of lots of things from the board. So you are talking about that uh, seismometer putting on the moon and the record over there. I have seen one uh, uh, seismogram on the moon. It shows that it's a long, it takes long time to attenuate. So the Kora is very long. It's like a sealed region. So what do we find in the Indian sealed region, the seismometer records, it's very much like uh, same. So can you comment on that? What material makes it to have a, very low attenuation over there. Uh, so could could you could you re, could you um, well uh, what yeah, what yeah. Uh, yeah what William's saying is that uh, uh, he's seen some seismo uh, uh, seismic uh, data from the moon, and he says that uh, uh, what he's seeing is that the signal is very attenuated, and yeah, it's yeah. pretty much pretty much like what we get in the shield areas. Am I right, William? That's what you said. Yeah, it's not attenuated. It takes long time to attenuate. Long time to long time to attenuate. Yeah, so the record is a very long, even if you're small magnitude. So that, the micro that's famous, right. that's a very long record, like Not a shield region type of yeah. yeah. And it's resemb very interesting. And resembles that in the shield, you said. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah. So, so that's, the, I think the, he wants you to comment on that. I understand now. Sorry, sorry about that. So the key point here is that um, that uh, you know um, 
this is one of the first things we noticed with the Apollo 11 seismometers. It, it took a long time for the signal to die out, if, we, if you will. And I think that's attributed to the nature of the regolith. Uh, it's a fragmental layer that increases in density as a function of depth, but it's still fragmental. And there's no water um, on the, in that layer. So basically, what you're seeing is ringing as the seismic waves are bouncing between particle and particle, and they're bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. And there's no water to damp them down, or there's no rock to decrease that uh, attenuation. And so, so it, it, it's just long term, it takes a long time for them to die out because of all that fragmental nature and the lack of water, I think, is, is, the, is the first order answer. But we need more seismic data to really test those ideas. That's very interesting, actually. And thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Uh, so Himela has a question. So Himela, can you put on your camera and ask? Uh, yeah. uh, hello, sir. Thank you for the beautiful lecture. It was really exciting. Uh, actually, I just wanted to know, uh, like, uh, I, I saw it on a Twitter account from NASA that some more samples are going to be unboxed. So uh, any idea like what kind of flaws we can expect from that? Uh, from where? Sorry, I, I missed the- NASA the, the... Twitter account recently, like supposedly from the Apollo 17 mission. If I'm not oh, yeah, 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 right, right. Yes, I understand, I understand. Sorry about that. Um, uh, the, so, so yes, the, 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 this is a group of uh, investigators who've gotten together to reopen uh, or to open uh, rocks that were collected on Apollo 17 that have not been looked at before. And th this is good because, uh, <laughs> you know, like we saw with the Alberto Sol and the water in the green glass, you know, capabilities to examine materials increase with time, big time. Okay. So we have much more sophisticated techniques that we did not have in 1970s, in the early 70s, when the Apollo samples uh, were brought back. And so that's the hope is that we will be able to look at all these new, these rocks that are open for the first time and look at questions that have evolved since that time. And you're asking what kind of questions? Well, partly it's related to the volatiles, like uh, on the, the green, uh, sorry, the orange glasses from Apollo 17 uh, and also the breaches and things like that. So we're asking new questions uh, about, you know, how they came together, um, you know, essentially the volatile loss as a function of time, whether the water was uh, in fact, uh, maybe came from the earth as opposed to the moon. Um, this is the range of kinds of questions. Uh, there were some interesting papers that came out in the uh, 53rd Lunar Planetary Science Conference last, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago um, in, in this area too, as they reported their first results. So, um, you know, it's going to be interesting. I don't, you know, there, there will be much more coming out with these kind of re-examination and not only new questions, but new people asking the questions, okay? <laughs> That's important too, because you need to have young people coming in and saying, hey, wait, how come, you know, this is this way? And you go, well, I, don't, I don't think we really know. And so, you know, keep asking those questions and the data are there to, to address them. Thank you, sir. Okay, so we have, uh, let's take a final question now. This is from Ochinto. I think I can ask this question and this, uh, the gentleman can actually get on himself. So it has to do with flow fractured craters on the moon. So mm -hmm. what he's asking is that there are a lot of them there. And uh, most of the time magma intrusion is the most common, uh, is the most accepted hypothesis. According to you, could there be any other mechanism other than magma intrusion leading to the formation of such fractures? Yeah, early on, the idea, the competing idea was that they represented viscous relaxation. So if you have a crater forming, um, and then, and then it, it, it slowly viscously relaxes, um, you know, due to flow in the uh, subsurface, that you could uplift the floor and crack it. Um, but based on the heat flow experiments, and, um, you know, the age of these craters, it looks very much like that's not a factor that was ruled out fairly early on, but that's another that's another um, type of thing that could form these things. And I think maybe on other planets that invest, you know, that possible interpretation needs to be uh, uh, analyzed uh, and either accepted or ruled out depending on the data for that particular planet. So that's an alternative interpretation that doesn't seem to be very favored on the moon at the present time. Right. 
So I think that's about uh, this a bit. And if uh, you've had more than half an hour of questioning and you're getting phone calls from CGTN, I understand. So uh, if uh, I think there are no other questions, so probably we can bring this to a formal end and I can uh, then conclude uh, finally Professor Head. I mean, before I conclude and thank you, would you like to say anything? I mean, just about the talk or in general, any comments? Sure. I, I think, you know, international cooperation and coordination is a critical way to go. We have a lot of questions to ask about the moon. When I say we, I don't mean Americans. I mean all of us, uh, people who study the earth, people who study the future, global warming and all these kinds of things. We need perspective and we need new ideas, new voices, new people, young people, enthusiastic people. Um, we need all the help we can get to solve these problems. So I really encourage you who have an interest in this to talk to your professors, uh, and and learn ways that you can get engaged and involved involved in these things because you know without that contribution uh, science will stay uh, stationary and and we we don't learn anything from that so please please um, get to work we got a lot of work to do and I really encourage you send me an email if you have any questions I'm happy to try to uh, address those as well so thank you very much it's a great honor um, to uh, address you all and and I look forward to personally visiting in the future thank you.